We are going now to welcome on stage three other speakers for our panel sessions. Megan Sapp, who is a farmer living 95% of grid on her farm in Navarra in Spain. She is originally from the US. She went from agricultural journalists to lobbyists to farmer and co-founder of the Hub del Norte, one of the many hubs that are part of the Savory Institute. Welcome. Uh, we're going to welcome also Morgane Iverniau. She's the global head of sustainability terroir at Pernod Ricard, a French-based company, which is the world's leading premium spirits company. The company produces and sources more than 100 ingredients from 60 countries and is committed to regenerative agriculture through, ta through um, targeting, empowering training, supporting over 500 farmers. So welcome, Morgan. And then we're going to welcome also Boris Pasky. He co-founded GridPods in 2020. And GreenPods is a fully integrated regenerative agriculture farm developer. And he's an almond producer. The first farm is La Granja in Toulouse. It's the France's largest organic almond orchard to have the label Bar Carbon. And he's going to explain that whenever they come to stage in a few minutes. <laughs> so we are going to have the, those three speakers in a panel session. The idea is to uh, deep dive into the principles that Benedict sets for us, the messages of hope, but also the uh, technical aspects of soil health and biodiversity. And he also asked a few questions that I think are interesting to to go through with you around profitability and scalability. So he, he, set, he set the scene for us. It's going to be very easy from now on. I'm going to check with them. Yes, please. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so, during the keynote, Benedict explains a bit about what he uh, implemented in his farm in Germany. Uh, you are all of three from three different organizations working with regenerative agriculture. Could you please uh, explain and share how you implemented regenerative agriculture in your own organizations? Maybe, Megan, if you want to, to start. No, great. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so about 10 years ago, my husband and I, who's in the audience today, we bought a farm um, with the intention of demonstrating how to live off-grid, how to live sustainably. Um, and uh, we started managing the land the way that my grandma had taught me. Um, and we were seeing between the management that I had been used to growing up, combined with the fact that the land that we had purchased had been horribly abused for the past 30 years by our dear neighbors, a very conventional dairy cooperative, we bought what my husband later referred to as a forest of uh, cardo, a forest of um, very unuseful, spiky, tall trees, plants that are a result of compacted land and um, too much nitrogen. Um, so around six years ago or so, uh, by complete accident, when I was trying to uh, finish up my undergraduate degree 20-something years later, um, I had a holistic management course. And this completely changed my, my life, our life, sorry, honey, um, because it brought together my 20 years or so of experience in uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy that I had been working on around the world. And it all suddenly started to make sense. So we put into practice uh, that first year, holistic management. And at the time, we only had horses. Um, and so we uh, dropped our um, maintenance costs for those horses by 80% that first year. And we said, OK, this works. Um, shortly after that came the pandemic and my uh, 100,000 kilometers a year of traveling came to a complete halt and I lost about a third of my income and that's when the panic sets in. You go, oh crap, what do I do now? Oh wait, I have a farm. 
Um, so thanks to holistic management and the holistic decision making and all the tools that come along with it, we began to uh, scale up what is actually production. And so then today we have a very um, diverse polyface farm um, with laying hens and fattening chickens and turkeys and horses and goats, uh, as well as market garden. And we produce about 70% of our own food and then supply to 30 or so families in the neighboring 50 kilometers between Pamplona and San Sebastian. Um, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, my, my colleague Caroline and I and some others decided that we wanted to really facilitate the transition. So we created Hub del Norte, which is the um, accredited hub for the Savory Institute, which permits us to, gives us the legitimacy to um, train farmers, uh, do advisory, uh, do ecological monitoring, to really be able to demonstrate if people are regenerating their soils or not. Okay. So that's a bit of how we got to where we Thank are today. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, and we'll, we'll go into the training part uh, a bit afterwards. Boris, you also own a farm. Would you be kind enough to explain a bit what you're doing in, in your farm? Sure. We, we don't own a farm. In 2020, we came across a farm that was for sale close to Toulouse, and it was uh, producing corn, conventional corn, on 150 hectares. Um, so we decided to convert this farm to organic, and we didn't have 2 million euros to buy that farm, so we had the fund my transition by that farm. They had identified access to land as a barrier to entry for people who wanted to get into farming, and it worked, and they're now leasing it back to us. So the idea was to convert a farm that was producing corn for the uh, Spanish pork industry. That corn was being exported every year to fattening stations, then these pigs were sent to the slaughterhouse, chopped, sliced and diced, and then shipped back to France. So we thought with my partner, Martin, that it was complete agroeconomic uh, nonsense. So what we did, we converted immediately half of the farm to well, the full farm to a rotation of soy, buckwheat, uh, sunflower, winter oats, winter, winter wheat, spelt, and then sorghum. And we then planted 64 hectares of organic almonds on the orchard. And this today is uh, one of the largest organic uh, region uh, orchards in France with full cover crops in between rows, so fava beans, um, you've got oats. And today this farm, it, it's interesting because we, when we came in, the soil was very compacted, you had no organic matter left. And what we did, we started, of course, we, we don't touch the soil anymore, we never leave it bare. So all pruning residues, everything that's being mowed, remains in the ground and slowly decomposes into the ground. So few, a few people remember that it's not a force, but if you actually plant trees in the, on degraded land, you do capture CO2. So at the end, you go from a net emitter to a carbon sink. And uh, this is where it's interesting. We, we, we became the largest farm to, uh, to get the um, label by carbon um, label. And uh, so you increase soil organic matter, you prevent erosion, you increase your, so if you increase soil organic carbon, you do as well increase the soil's water retention capacity. So at the end, uh, how you do regenerate ecosystems, one first, first ecosystem service, you, um, you produce food and you increase food security, French food security, by you know, having to import less. We import 400,000 tons of uh, nuts every year and 40 million tons of GM soy in Europe. That's quite a lot. Um, you do combat climate change, you'll become a carbon sink. You do adapt to climate change because you're actually uh, adapting to the climate frontier moving north. And on the other side, uh, you're as well restoring biodiversity. That's the concept of land degradation neutrality. You are um, restoring key system services such as pollination, pest control. Um, you, so this is, uh, an orchard is a very, it's a very positive land use change to go from a degraded monoculture to, to an orchard. And so now we have, uh, because Region Ag is still not determined, I think it's important to have a certification. So we decided to become the first Region Ag certified farm in France. And I think it's important to back your claims. And we measure um, the, the soil organic carbon, the pollution levels with a French startup called Genesis. And of course, we, we work uh, with uh, good consultants because you need to be surrounded by the best. We have the same, uh, for example, Biosphere, the ones that Bernard Ricard uses. We work with the same ecosystem of people who know, and it helps you 
we'll talk about it later, uh, adapt to certain surprises. Okay, thank you very much, Boris. And lastly, Morgan, so you, you are in a different part of the supply chain than uh, Boris and Megan, but it's interesting to know that you also committed, as Pernod Ricard, to regenerative agriculture. So Boris mentioned that you're working with consultancy firms to set up frameworks. Could you tell us a bit more about the framework and how you implement it in the different terroirs? Yes. So I think I will uh, build on what uh, Megan and Boris just said about the holistic characteristic of the, the approach and the, the, all the outcomes that we can generate uh, through regenerative agriculture. So just to shape the, the scene, Pernod Ricard is uh, one of the leaders in the wine and spirit industry, so we rely on uh, what we call terroir. We are really rooted in, in the land where uh, our ingredients are grown. That's why we need to ensure that they are this terroir um, are uh, built on a well-functioning ecosystem. So we think that uh, the holistic approach has to be collaborative between all the ma market players at the terroir level. So that's what we, we, we join uh, international coalitions like uh, PADV or OP2B or uh, other ones to adopt a common language. It's a way to uh, ask for the same uh, outputs uh, to the same terroir. So we join forces with uh, other uh, players like uh, Heineken, uh, Muetensi, uh, Danone, uh, and many other ones to think about uh, how to ask for outputs. So we ask, as uh, Boris said, for carbon things. We ask for biodiversity and how we can recreate uh, ecosystem services. So we all ask for the same outputs. The, the main difficulty today is to translate outputs into practices on the ground, meaning that we need to think about what are the challenges at the terroir level. Um, simply, it's a, a way to tailor made for each location, depending on, on their challenges. In some cases, it's water stress. In other cases, it's, it's soil erosion. So we need to think about what happened on the ground and to um, embark and empower the, all the communities. That's why we, we build uh, in, in this terroir approach to identify all the stakeholders. So we identify experts like uh, Biosphere, we identify other peers, we identify farmers, of course, and all the, the actors of the supply chain. And as you said, we are at the end of the supply chain. So we need to align um, all together in the same language and in the same um, framework uh, to ask for uh, practices implementation and to support. Because we, to be honest, I'm not a farmer. Even if I'm a great, uh, an engineer in agroecology, I'm not a farmer. So I, I'm no one to tell a farmer what to do on the ground. I just need to support and to identify what they need to put in place new practices or in some cases, in many cases, it's super old practices <laughs> when it comes to agroecology, but uh, we need to um, support uh, this uh, change on the ground. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so you all have been working on regenerative agriculture at different scales and on different crops. You started to explain a bit of the, the key elements of success. We've talked about collaboration between stakeholders, We've talked about a test and learn approach. Um, which would be the key takeaways, the success stories? And if you want, maybe some of the failures you had along the way that could help also identify the, um, yeah, the, the way to go on regenerative, one of the ways to go on regenerative agriculture. You want to, to start, Boris? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think when, when you engage into a process of change, you, you do face a tremendous, yeah, it's a very steep learning curve, and as well, you, it, it does imply a trial and error process. Um, for example, if you go from conventional to organic, uh, you still got a very, you've got a huge uh, stock of seeds from your weeds, and once you stop, uh, the fact that they have been contained by chemicals for 30 years doesn't mean that the, the seed stock is not present anymore. So once you stop, uh, it's like a, it's like a rave party for your weeds, and they just jump right back at your face. So the first soy harvest we had. We planted soy in spring, and th this first harvest came as a big disappointment. It, it was tough. We were not well organized. We didn't plant in advance. 
plant in advance. Then the same happened with your young seedlings. Young seedlings, when you plant small trees, they, they face very harsh competition from weeds. And we had Xanthium, we had uh, Datura, we had uh, Horseweed, Erigiron du Canada, which are symptomatic of very degraded land. So, of course, there is a J-curve. Plus, you do invest a lot. You, you, s you have all pivot irrigation systems. You send them to the scrap metal yard. Then you install state-of-the-art uh, Israeli drip technology. It comes at a cost. The soil is degraded. What do you do? You throw in green waste, horse manure. And then suddenly you realize that your weeds are growing really well because you're feeding horse manure to your weeds, you're irrigating your weeds as well, and sometimes we get surprises. We, we had, this is technical, but we had our drip lines on the ground, we didn't want to bury them, we were afraid that they would get clogged, and at the end we couldn't mow well, so it took us a week to get 100, yeah, just 100 kilometers of drip lines out. It's a, uh, well, it's a good workout, plus it's expensive, and here is maybe, it's not a success story, but it's a very handy tool, it's the Label Carbon. Uh, if you've got these surprises that come with an associated cost, if you use the label by carbon, which was set by the French government, France is paving the way in that EU carbon farming initiative, it serves two purposes. One, to have France meet its uh, commitments that it made during the Paris Accords at COP21. And two, is to encourage farmers to shift practices by... It's an incentive because they know that they can monetize better practices. So we did it, we, we got certified, we did it directly with no intermediary, and we got 4,500 tons of emission reductions. We sold them directly. Some of the sales, we even reached the 100 euro per ton uh, price level, which I think is a good market signal because it shows that some people are willing to contribute. It was the report from Joseph Stiglitz and Nicholas Stern said, at 100 euros per ton, the carbon market will start shifting. So it means that some people are paying for ecosystem services, and so, yeah, let's, let's be honest, it's not easy, but if you do everything according to the playbook, it can be done, and you have some de-risking tools available to make things work. So if you're patient, it, it does work. Okay, thank you. It's interesting to, to deep dive on the profitability, profitability aspect of it, and Label by Carbon is one way to go to monetize some of the efforts or practices that are being implemented in regenerative agriculture system. Do you also focus, Megan, on the financial part of the equation in holistic management? I, absolutely. There's a saying that if you're not profitable, you're not regenerative. And, and we very much believe this. Um, within holistic management, we have a number of planning tools. Um, much of what we do is understanding um, our relationship with the ecosystem, with natural processes, and how to uh, produce food, how to create uh, the landscape where we're in, but doing it with nature instead of against her. And one of these ways uh, that we think about this is uh, holistic financial planning, where we plan our profit before our costs. And what that does is it forces us to open up our minds to really not only identifying uh, financial leakages within our models, but also breaking away from the models that perhaps what we're trying to do, combining where we want our, our landscape to be, either it's our farm or our community or our county or whatever, what we're trying to do with the quality of life that we want to have, that is um, that we're not worried about uh, paying the mortgage payments, that we're not worried about making it to the end of the year, that we're not working 100 hours a week because there's this idea, unfortunately, within the food and ag sector that in order to produce food, in order to be a farmer or a livestock producer, you have to almost kill yourself in the attempt, you know? Um, but what we understand is that if we as humans are not uh, in a good place emotionally, financially, uh, mentally, then we're not doing good for anywhere else. Um, and this feeds back in part to the financial piece. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of people who are, uh, you know, purebred limousine breeders, or, you know, I am a wheat farmer, or I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> you are a landscape manager, uh, a steward, who is trying to create abundance of life, but this abundance of life automatically translates into abundance of wealth. Then we have to have questions of, about what wealth means uh, to each of us, but it allows us to then create our lives in such a way where we can create business models 
that then allow us to no longer rely on the common agriculture policy, for example, which is a whole other uh, box of worms that we can get into in, in another time. But the point is, is that it allows us to, to take back that responsibility in decision making um, and to create uh, this relationship with with our animals, with our plants, with nature, with our communities, and be creating um, very high value, highly nutrient dense food. And, and this relationship begins to change. So it's no longer we're producing cheap uh, commodities that are then sold into markets where we have no control over it. Um, it's really about understanding who we are, what we need, what we want, what the community needs, what we can produce, and how we can do that in the least expensive way possible um, while providing uh, highly nutrient-dense food. So I think it's, it's a much more holistic vision you know, than just how do we attack the carbon market, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Thank you. So um, we've talked about failures and successes, so a test and learn approach, how it's important to have a holistic approach between the technical and the financial part. Um, it's also about how to make the farmer job attractive and making it, yeah, attractive. Um, so it's, it's something around how do we de-risk this transition to regenerative practices. I think it's something that you've worked on at Pernod. Would you, would you mind telling us a bit more about it? Yes. So yes, if I take the seat of a buyer at a corporate level like Pernod Ricard, um, we need to change the way we buy the raw material, switching from the commodity market to a more regenerative market with much more um, uh, volatility in terms of yield, for example, in the first years at least, and um, a black box for many buyers because uh, historically, uh, this is this, uh, there is this um, commodity market driving the whole in food industry. Now, uh, the first step, because uh, we talk about change management and how to change the mindset, in including internally, uh, it's uh, how to better understand what are the risks uh, within the whole value chain, starting from the farm to uh, the, the plant where we, we distillate our products. So um, thinking about risks, uh, it's a way to stabilize the yields first. Uh, what we do is to better understand cycles, natural cycles, and how uh, many, different, uh, many different parameters can affect yields, starting from uh, the, the farmer, how it changes practices, and maybe uh, with successes or failure in some cases. Uh, so we need to be there to absorb uh, this uh, yield volatility uh, for the first uh, three to five years at least. And then uh, we need to think about the long run uh, because we see two steps. The first is uh, how we build the regenerative model. So meaning that we need first to um, start by trailing some new practices like cover crops or uh, um, developing more diversified farms because we buy only crops but uh, we know that uh, for example we need um, to increase the organic matter content within the soil so we need the livestock industry so we need the whole landscape to ensure that we go uh, to resilience meaning that we need to create an alliance with other players. So it's a way to de-risk as well the, the transition by um, aligning all the buyers for a single farm in the same way and same direction. So we agree to buy uh, maybe all the rotation at farm level by asking for the same uh, output, as I said. So um, this is a second way to de-risk as a transition to consider the farm as a whole instead of considering only the crop we buy for uh, our whiskies or, uh, or jeans. And then to support uh, in the continuity in, in the practices to keep uh, the carbon in soils or to attract uh, biodiversity, functional biodiversity, wild and so on, uh, we need to think about uh, how to secure incomes uh, and well-being. 
So we have in our compass, in our regenerative agriculture compass, we have uh, five impact areas. So we have climate, biodiversity, water, soil, and we have also livelihood. So in the livelihood uh, impact we want to achieve, we have profitability, of course. We have uh, also uh, well-being, because we think that when we switch from a conventional uh, model into a regenerative model, it's a huge risk for uh, all the families that uh, are historically in, in farming. Uh, so um, we need to do it step by step, to change mindset, uh, mindset uh, sorry, step by step, and uh, to identify what will change in their daily basis and how they will become more and more happy, <laughs> in some cases, to switch from uh, their tractor to, to see on the ground what happened within the soil, for example. So it's a way to give this new uh, model more attractive uh, for farmers as well as for uh, consumers. And I, I just want to, to highlight also the fact that we need to, to do our job as a company as well um, by changing the mindset in the way we buy, uh, as I said. So in the way we buy, we need to be okay to take the risk as well in, in, in the prices we pay our raw material and to identify what could happen if uh, we do nothing. So to do that, we have assessed the, the cost of inaction for Pernod Ricard. What about uh, we do nothing on, on, on farming, on agriculture, and what will be the cost of procurement in the future? And it's a way for us to size the right economic model to ensure the, the, way, the, the right transition from uh, the, the farming uh, that are operating today to the, the new model we want to achieve, saying that if we do nothing, we will have this cost, but if we do that, okay, it's, uh, it's most costly for the first three to five years, but then we will be ready um, to, to keep going on, on, the, on our business. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I think it resonates with what the Benedict is doing with the foundation about true cost of production and how we can put into the cost of production all the externalities, positive and negative externalities. And I think it's one key element of uh, replicability and scalability of the models, because if we find uh, a an, an business model for regenerative agriculture that can uh, integrate the true costs of, uh, of production, it can help to scale it uh, at, yeah, at the right scale. Um, it's the, the last question because we only have a few minutes left, but scalability and replicability is some key element of your model at GreenPod, so I think it would be interesting for, for you to, to tell us a bit about it. Sure, and I think that the context is important because the DU has set the objective of converting 25% of our agricultural area to organic by 2030. We're not there yet. Uh, we've got another issue, 62 billion this is the financing gap identified by the EU for farmers every year. People applying for loans and getting rejected. And then you've got 50% of the farmers in France and Spain which are poised to reach the age of retirement by 2030. So how do you go from there? You need a Marshall Plan. You need a massive influx of people, young people preferably with talent, and you need a massive influx of capital. So once you have developers who emerge, who resemble very much what's been done in the renewable energy sector, people who can uh, design, build, execute, and manage projects, this is what you need to go to scale. And then you can replicate. But to replicate, you need the money, you need the pump of the economy. And for this, financiers always look at different uh, sectors like asset classes. And once you have developers and you have counterparties that are bankable, bankable projects, financiers will come. Today, they focus very much, even impact funds focus on... Uh, Act tech, so drones, robots, uh, spectral analysis, software as a service, replicating the playbook of tech where fortunes were made, but we don't eat drones and we don't eat robots. At the end, what you need is primary production. So they won't achieve double digit returns with primary production. So I think it's easier to consider agriculture to be uh, along the lines of green infrastructure. Infrastructure investors, they know that things take 20 years to build. It's extremely capital intensive. And if you want to solve project um, issues like land degradation, you, you, it's not five people coming out of uni in a, with a hoodie. You, you need people who are in their 60s and their 50s. So you need to go, it's the Olympic year, you need to go faster, higher, and stronger. And for this, you need patient capital. 
Yeah, okay, thank you. And Megan, some <laughs> other elements of replicability would be training, and I know it's a big part of uh, your day-to-day -day job, so maybe as a conclusion, uh, to, to tell us a bit about the training that you're doing? Yeah, exactly. Um, as Morgan said, it really it's all about mindset and helping people to, to, to de-risk that transition by helping to uh, teach them how the, the environment works, how their relationship with the environment. And the more that they do it, the more that they learn, the more that they fail, the more that they're in uh, amongst the community of practitioners where we're all working together and learning based on our own context how to do this, the faster we can transition. Uh, really, it's all about scale and how many farmers we can get to and how many of them we can uh, accompany and hold hands with them on their journey so that they can be making this transition as quickly as possible. I, I'm always telling my students to fail as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible um, so that we can just move forward, move forward. And really, you know, there are only so many of us who are training right now. So as much as I need to be out there farming trainer, tra farming trainers, training farmers, um, I need to be out there training trainers as well. And for me, that's one of the big bottlenecks is how can we get as many people as possible on the ground with that experience that they can then be translating to farmers who are older, who are, but also to the young farmers who maybe who don't have access to land in order for them to get to land. When these investors come, they need to be able to rely on people who already have experience, who already have this m mindset, this mentality, to be able to, to have this army of, of young and middle-aged farmers ready to do this transition. So. Um, we're already very active in Spain. We're starting in France. In the next three weeks, we have our first French language course in holistic management, we're very excited about. So if you're interested in being a trainer or being a farmer, come and talk to us afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think our, our time is up. Thank you to all the three of you. If I had to sum up in a few words, I would want to highlight uh, those few words. So holistic approach, replicability, scalability, and need for competencies, uh, willingness to go there, and money. And I guess that's something that we're going to continue the discussion in the fireside chat. Thank you very much. Thank you.